Yeah, I'm about yeah. to go on the uh, webinar. The uh, Chinese General, yeah, Chamber of Commerce. The, the Chinese uh, General Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much on point. But um, first of all,
<laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, Hello. All right, so I guess all the panelists, um, can we all just say hello so I know your microphone works? Hi there. This is Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Louis, I think you just muted yourself again. Can you unmute yourself, Louis? Did he hear? Hi, everyone. Hi, Officer Chow. How's it going? Good, good. Probably get uh, interrupted a few times, but <laughs> we'll make it work. <laughs> no, appreciate you joining us well on duty. Um, Are you in a car? You're you're uh, patrolling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good, Louis. Okay, so now you're on mute. Can you can you can you just say something so we know your microphone works? You know, we kind of heard you before. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That great. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so now it all works. I'm sure there will be more attendees trickling in. I just see the numbers start jumping up. Uh, so why don't we get uh, get started? So um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another installment of the uh, eConnect series hosted by the China General Chamber of Commerce. My name is Go Yu. I'm the DC Regional Executive Director for CGCC. Today we're discussing how to protect Asian businesses and communities from discrimination and hate during COVID-19. Now, before I hand off to our great panelists, I have a few housekeeping items to let you know. Okay, one, uh, if you're new to our chamber, uh, we encourage you to visit our website at cgccusa.org. We are the largest nonprofit organization representing Chinese businesses in the US. If you search our name on, on your preferred social media platform, you'll be able to follow us on social media too. Uh, two, in addition to the, today's webinar, we have a lot of uh, resources on our website to help you stay safe during the pandemic, including resources on how to protect yourself from discrimination and how to report hate incidences to your local authorities. We'll put up that link to our resource page at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. Um, and three, you're welcome to ask questions and interact with our panelists during the webinar, but please do that by tapping in the Q&A window of the Zoom map. Because of the time lag issue of online communications, allowing everybody to speak will just be too chaotic. So audience will be muted uh, throughout the entire webinar. Uh, please use the Q&A function. Okay, so as you can see, uh, if you have visited the event page, we have a really terrific panel today. We have experts from across the country and the various professional backgrounds representing academia, law enforcement, legal professionals, and local government officials. Uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Russell Jiang is the chair and professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. He is the leading scholar on today's topic. He's an author of multiple books on race and religion. His latest publication is Family Sacrifices, the Worldviews and Ethics of Chinese Americans. Now he helped launch the Stop AAPI Hate Center, which tracks incidents of coronavirus discrimination and uses this data to advocate for Asian American communities. Officer Sir Chow is a police officer in the Port Authority Police Department in New York. He is also the president of the PAPD Asian Jade Society. Uh, because the Port Authority PD protects all the major airports, bridges, and tunnels in the New York, New Jersey area, I think Officer Chow is uh, intimately familiar with the stigma uh, Asian populations have faced during travel since the pandemic. And he will also give us some important tips about how to engage law enforcement to protect our community during this period. Uh, attorney Karen King is a lawyer from the law firm Paul West. Uh, she is also the vice chair of the pro bono committee for the Asian American Bar Association of New York. Karen's pro bono work has uh, helped many members of the Asian American community to receive legal assistance and justice. Because of that, she's been a recipient of the uh, Distinguished Advocate for Justice Award, uh, Award the uh, Thurgood Marshall Award for Exceptional Pro Bono Service, and the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association's Pro Bono Awards. 
Mr. Louis Boronda is the Deputy Secretary of State from the great state of Maryland. Uh, appointed by Governor Larry Hogan in 2015, he is the first Hispanic uh, in Maryland history to serve as uh, Deputy Secretary of State. As a member of the Hispanic community, Lewis has uh, uh, witnessed many common threads in the adverse experiences our community has faced. Uh, before government service, he came from the private sector, so he also understands the challenges minority businesses face at this, at this difficult time. Uh, and so as you can see, we hope to cover a large swath of topics today. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, Professor Jiang, thank you for uh, joining our webinar today. Why don't you kick us off uh, with what you have seen in your research on COVID-19 discriminations? Thank you. Uh... Good you and thank you, China General Chamber of Commerce, for inviting us today. Um, it's an honor to share what we've been learning. And I have a presentation about um, the data we've gotten in the last three, four weeks um, at our reporting site. And so I want to start off with um, a litany of lament. These are just a fraction of the cases that we've received. And these are just reports that came in the last week. Um, and again, the reports that we've received, we've gotten over 1,500 cases, are just the tip of the iceberg of what's going around um, in the nation currently. So I'll just read them to you. And I just want you to feel the sentiment and the um, trauma that Chinese Americans and Asian Americans are experiencing at this time. I'm posting this on behalf of my dad, a 71-year-old Korean adoptee. Yesterday, he was chased out of a rural convenience store after asking to use the restroom while traveling along I-5 through California. I was sitting on the New Jersey Transit. A man looked at me, went out of his way to lean inside, and coughed on me. He made eye contact with me and walked away. My niece was at Kroger on today, and this lady spat on an Asian family after insulting them because the coronavirus was their fault. We were having community circle in our grade four classroom. One of the students said, kill the Chinese in Spanish when it his, was his turn to speak. Many of the Spanish speaking children laughed. This is very, very bizarre, but ex-husband threatened me that if I don't sign an agreement to follow a corona guideline, he will not return my child to me. Also, he screamed in front of my child saying, I don't want to be around you. You're bringing the corona to me and this is my This person said, you got the China. He also commented, I feel like Trump should use nuclear to finish China. A white male customer in the drive-thru asked my ethnicity and assumed I had the coronavirus. He replied defensively, the virus came from China. After I gave his credit card back, he wiped his hands and card and discuss us if he had the disease. Overheard in a public restroom, thank God no Chinese were at soccer practice to infect others. I tried to correct the aspersion, but was totally ignored by white patron. We own and operate a Japanese restaurant. On 326, four glass window panels were vandalized and shattered. We boarded the windows only to be a victim of graffiti the next day. On both days of the incident, I visually inspected the other businesses on the block. Our business was singled out. My kids were at the park with their dad. An older white man pushed my seven-year-old daughter off her bike and yelled at my husband to take your hybrid kids home because they're making everyone sick. I got pushed and slammed on the floor by a neighbor who lost his job. He yelled at me, I lost my job because Asians. I got my back, neck, and hand hurt. I wore a face mask on BART to work. There were about five black African teenagers saying I have the coronavirus and they used their backpacks to hit me. So as I was saying, um, these are just typical of the kind of incidents we've been receiving in the last four weeks. And um, yesterday was the last, um, was the fourth week we've been in operation and 1500 reports. And so what I'm gonna talk about is just what kind of reports we're receiving um, and then try to understand, which is actually a really good question, um, why is this, this outbreak or the sudden um, state of anti-Asian racism now. I'll quickly go over then the impact of this racism on the communities and what Asian Americans are doing for, to them, for themselves. 
So as you can see, um, th these are the types of um, issues that Asian Americans are facing. Most of the cases are verbal harassment and shunning, but they're not mere microaggressions. Um, the verbal harassment is often accompanied with yelling, with um, vehement hate, um, with a lot of scapegoating. And so I wouldn't say they're just simply microaggressions, but they're actually often traumatizing experiences. Physical assault and actually being coughed and spat upon make up about 15% of the cases. And I think this is unique to the uh, public health crisis are coughing and spitting on us. Um, that could constitute an assault as well. It could constitute a hate crime. And it could also con constitute terrorism. Um, one white person was arrested for terrorism when he coughed on a white cashier. But this happens hundreds of times to the country. And so you could say we're facing mass terrorism against Asians. Um, workplace discrimination is going on a lot now. And this other category, which is I think is now growing, is mostly property crime, graffiti, and vandalism. As we're sheltered in place, we're having less interpersonal confrontations, and so we're seeing more Asian businesses being um, sort of vandalized. Um, people say the reason for discrimination often is just your race. 60% of our cases are non-Chinese. So this isn't just affecting a, um, Chinese, but it's affecting Asians of all ethnicities who look Chinese. So people are racially profiling us. And if you look Chinese, they'll make an automatic assumption. Another key reason for discrimination is about 17% identify the face mask for being the reason why people are discriminating against them. But you can't win. If you wear a face mask, they think you're a disease carrier and they'll attack you. If you don't wear a face mask and you're Asian, they'll think, oh, you're being negligent. And so they'll attack you. So you can't win. Um, for those of you as members of the Chamber of Commerce, you see that businesses are the primary site of this discrimination. And as we see more as we shelter in place, the only places Asian Americans go to now are grocery stores mostly, and that's where they're having a lot of the confrontations. Before shelter in place, there was a lot of public transit incidents, a lot of stuff going on in parks for kids and in schools. So the question is, why are people hating Asians now at this particular time? What's sort of fomenting and inciting this racism? And um, if you've never experienced this racism before, you might be surprised. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the key factors that are leading up to this current new um, spate of discrimination. What we found in our analysis, especially the news content analysis, is that xenophobic rhetoric really does stir up and open up um, the doors towards racism. So as you probably know, um, President Trump insisted on calling the coronavirus the Chinese virus, even though he was told time and time again not to use it, that place-based names um, stigmatize Asians and would actually lead to the attack of Asians. He didn't care and he continued to use the term Chinese virus. And so when people, when <clears throat> um, politicians use that rhetoric, um, people then began to make the automatic association the virus is caused by Chinese, and Chinese people are carriers and infected by the virus. So they make that quick association because they hear so much from the politicians. You can see this is part of the um, agenda to blame China and to China bash. It's easy to do so because China is communist, China is an economic competitor to the US, and China was a source of the disease. And so um, to avoid taking any responsibility of the disease, to deflect blame, to rile the base. Um, political parties are using China Bash as a way to um, scapegoat and to blame others. And so you can see all these headlines talking about how politicians are blaming China. The worst case is when um, taking out ads and one ad in Texas said, China poisoned our people. It's by, um, a candidate in Texas. Another ad shows um, Chinese American Governor Gary Locke as being portrayed as a Chinese person and Biden is weak on China because he appeared with um, Chinese American Gary Locke. So I'm really concerned with this China bashing because it just gives people license 
to bash Chinese people and people who look like Chinese. Accompanying the political rhetoric are the media representations. The media has to report on what the politicians say. And if you remember, a lot of the stories were initially about um, <clears throat> um, China, and here the Wall Street Journal said China, the real sick man of Asia. And they often portrayed the disease or stories about COVID-19 with Chinese people wearing masks. And so this representation further ingrains this notion that the virus um, is related to Chinese people and Chinese people are related to the virus. So then when people see Chinese people, they think of the virus automatically. Today, what's even worse is that we have a lot of social media that circulates and um, especially youth are exposed to thousands of pictures, of, of posts about the virus related to China and weird things about China, like Chinese eat bats. Um, the picture on the left is an Instagram post of a uh, University of Albany party where they had a coronavirus party and they put masks over the beer and the keg and they showed pictures of Chinese looking people wearing masks and they posted that on Instagram. So these are just sort of the images that people get and as a result, both politicians, China bashing, media circulating these representations you can't help but to um, think that Chinese people are associated with a virus. Media relate to a historic factor, the yellow peril. The yellow peril is a stereotype that the West has that um, Asians are a threat to the West and that they're going to come and dominate the West um, with their hordes, they're going to outnumber the West, and is particularly they're gonna bring their diseases to the West to dominate. And so they've used this yellow peril stereotype in the past to um, enact the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. They use this stereotype to quarantine Chinese in 1900. They've used this stereotype to incarcerate Japanese Americans during World War II. They use this stereotype after 9-11 to um, justify attacks on South Asians and Muslim looking people. So this is the process by which people begin to um, understand COVID-19. First of all, you have a general truth that the source of the virus is in China, but then because of the political rhetoric, um, people began to associate and link the virus to Chinese people. The media continues to show the Chinese virus and representing it with people in face masks. So what happens then is that when people see a face mask and an Asian person, they automatically think those people are infected or diseased. If you see a white person wearing a mask, you think, oh, they're simply protecting themselves. But if an Asian's wearing a mask, they're more likely to be infected, more likely to be a threat. So this is what we call racialization, where a mask is seen as an object of scorn and people began to make automatic assumptions based so what happens then is once masks and the disease get racialized, people began to use racial profiling. They make automatic assumptions and have automatic responses. So here's the process that's going on. For First of all, we develop a racial schema. In the United States, the three things people notice about you are your age, your gender, and your race. So if they see you, oh, there's an Asian person, and if they have a schema about the disease, they're more primed or more ready to notice things about you as an Asian. And so they'll note if you have a face mask. Then if they see you with this schema, with this way of thinking, they're hardwired to make automatic assumptions. And so um, they'll attribute your behavior to your racial uniform. They'll see you with a mask and they'll automatically assume you're a disease carrier. If you're a disease carrier, Again, biologically, we're hardwired to feel, oh, that's a threat. I should either fight or flight. And that's what's happening. People are seeing Asians and they're fleeing. And there's high rates of shunning Asian Americans, avoiding them on transit, or they'll want to fight you. They'll attack you and harass you. I think everybody's racist, but we are, say, are saying people that have implicit biases that make them automatically think about the virus being related to Chinese people. I even have this racial profiling implicit bias. 
I'm more likely to assume that a Chinese person is more likely to have the virus than a white person, for example. So we're not saying people are racist, but we are saying that this disease is racialized and that people use racial profiling. It's our biological evolutionary response for survival. But what happens though is, is that it has tragic impacts on the community. So now quickly, I'm gonna talk about some of the impacts on Asian Americans. And because of the spate of discrimination, you're seeing what's happening and its effect on the community. First of all, there's clear institutional boycotts of Asian businesses. Um, in general, Chinatowns report 50 to 70% business decline before shelter in place. And so um, a lot of the workers are gonna be economically hard hit. And so this is gonna have repercussions for years to come. On the interpersonal level, we see high levels of assault and attacks. Um, in Australia, one Chinese person died because no one was, would help him. They were afraid he was infected. In Texas, um, a person said he thought they were Chinese, so he stabbed a refugee from Burma and his two children. He slashed them in the head. That's now reporting, being reported as a hate crime. So we're seeing a lot more attacks. I don't think it's unlikely. I think actually the hate will grow as we stay more sheltered in place, as more people die of COVID. Um, as China bashing continues, we can only expect these incidences to um, grow. And then finally, um, this is really impacting Asian American individuals themselves. 90% of Asian Americans fear racial bias because of the COVID-19, 90%. Um, and especially youth, because they're exposed to social media and because they're on their screens a lot, they're especially scared. What happens is that they perceive themselves the way others perceive them. So if others perceive them as a threat, if others perceive them as a stigma, Asian kids may sort of self-stigmatize themselves. They may self-shun um, themselves and want to avoid their Asian background because it's seen as dirty, as exotic and weird as other. And so again, this will have long-term impacts too um, for both the fear would produce anxiety and depression and that self-stigmatization um, really leads to maybe a lower self-esteem and a weaker identity. So what are Asian Americans doing to protect themselves at this time? I said that politics and media are the main sources causing this uptick and it's impacting the community, but I see Asian Americans really fighting back. In history, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans have always resisted and fought back against discrimination. And today we're using the same approaches on the political level, on the media level, and on the community level. Um, trying to fight back on the political rhetoric, Governor Gary Locke um, went out on the news and challenged that Trump ad. Both the House and the Senate have um, passed resolutions denouncing anti-Chinese rhetoric. Um, our Asian American political officials have convened groups and have really worked hard to advocate. In California, our legislators have denounced the anti-Asian hate and gotten our governor to make an official statement against it. So on a political level, we have now Chinese American and Asian American officials who are standing up for us. And I think that's a big change than in the past. <clears throat> on the media level, I think Asian Americans are pretty good at technology. So we're creating all these sort of campaigns to wash the ha hate. We have all these uh, hashtag campaigns. We've seen a lot of our celebrities and popular athletes coming out and standing against the xenophobia and the racism. And so that's a good thing that now that we have more prominent um, personalities, they're claiming their Asian American identity and taking stands against us. And that's pretty powerful, especially for young people. And on the community level, we see our Chinatowns and our um, organizations quickly mobilizing to address the issue. So here's an example in San Francisco, Chinatown, they held a large rally and their um, groups like the Chinese Chamber of Commerce are um, promoting 
use um, going back to Asian businesses and um, being patrons of them. So this forum, for example, is just an example of community resistance of how to protect ourselves. And finally, our nonprofit agencies, our civil rights organizations. Um, I was just off a call uh, nationally of 38 Asian American leaders. We're working together and networking, coming up with a national strategy to stop the China bashing, to counter the media representations, and making sure that the community voice is heard. So I think um, you know we mobilized really quickly. We knew from history that Asian Americans were going to be scapegoated, so we created this reporting site. And so we've been tracking. And with all our data, we've gone to Congress and said, you got to stop this. We've gone to our California government and said, can you fund these programs um, to enforce hate crimes? Can you fund these programs to encourage ethnic studies so that kids learn their history and learn empathy? So I encourage all of you today, um, you work through the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, work through your community organizations, work through um, your elected officials to report what's going on, to stand up again, and to um, come up with real clear interventions that what businesses can do to, um, to actually promote global cooperation during this international pandemic. Thanks. Thank you for that uh, very informative introduction, Dr. Down, and, and a very comprehensive to it is truly eye-opening. It was so disheartening to hear those testimonials from people who's been subjugated to, to this kind of hate. Um, and, and hopefully through webinars like we have today and more of the research and outreach that uh, leaders like you are doing and will, will turn the tide and as we flatten the curve, we will also flatten the curve on, on discrimination against Asian communities. Uh, so next, uh, let's move to uh, Officer Chow. Um, so, uh, for for those of you who don't know, Officer Officer Chow actually he himself uh, recently recovered from uh, the coronavirus. Uh, you know, he he's he's in a high risk profession because he has to deal with crowds of people every day. Um, and we really appreciate you, Officer Chow, and your fellow officers for your sacrifice and congratulations on your uh, recovery. Um, tell us a little bit about what you have seen patrolling our uh, BD ports and registry states. Thank you for having me. Um, I, right now, most of our facilities are pretty uh, quiet and uh, uh, empty because nobody's really traveling. I mean, the airports are, and and all our facilities are still open, and we have. Uh, people and police officers uh, patrolling all the airports and uh, like I, I, I work at LaGuardia and we have people patrolling here and all our facilities or really transportation uh, except for like uh, the World Trade Center is really but uh, even there is, is a big transportation hub so that's where we really uh, you could say work and everything. Personally, I've I haven't really seen much um, discrimination or hate. One, there's for several reasons. I was quarantined, so I was at home for the past uh, three weeks. I just started. I just came back this week, actually, to to work and talking to other officers and other members of uh, my society. When we're in uniform, nobody's really gonna say anything to us too. That's that's the other thing. Maybe like uh, when we're not in uniform, some people will see it. I mean, we, we all probably seen it or heard of it. Uh, I, I'm in other uh, groups of social media where other like, I guess with like other Asian societies also like um, Chinatown groups and stuff like that, uh, line dancer, line dancing groups that, and they, 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 uh, you know, they share their experiences also. And I've spoke with a few other people, but as being a police officer, when I'm in uniform, no, no, not too many people are going to say anything to us already, <laughs> just because the uniform alone, which is, I guess, which is good too. But yeah, personally, I had, I haven't 
and speaking to other uh, police officers, I haven't really, uh, we haven't really seen it. But yes, there, I know, I know it's out there. I've seen it, and being speaking with other people in like these, uh, you say these online uh, social media platforms, it's it's definitely uh, out there, and it's as as a police officer, I guess you could say it's it's hard to. Uh, like you could say it's hard to be seeing ourselves as civilians also because most of the time we're not whether we're in uniform or not we're not civilians so we have to treat all all uh you know all personal uh experiences a little differently and there are a lot of issues with like even like even with Asian people trying to report issues that happen to them, there's a lot of uh, the issues that you know some people just don't like police officers and stuff like that, and don't like police. They they might feel like there's a language barrier. They might be immigrants, so they illegal immigrants actually. So they don't want to you know put the name out there saying, and you know. They feel like they might get deported or something, or or reported because they are immigrants. I mean, illegal immigrants, and they're scared of that. So, so there's a lot of fear of that also. But being a uh, a police officer, that you know, when we get called to any of these uh, occurrences or anything like that that might occur, we have to first distinguish whether a crime occurred what the elements of the crime that occurred. And then we, we will take the report and then we'll, prov we'll, we'll pass it on to whoever needs to go. Every, uh, every county has a, has a, 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 you could say a department really that takes all these reports and they, they create data for it and pass it on to wherever it needs to go. We, what the guidance we can actually provide is like, if you're for victims is having, uh, provide them with any victim services that the county, or almost all counties or cities have these victim services and or social services, and then or provide them with other information towards counseling. But having these people or these victims reported to us is really, it's really uh, tough. Because just, just because of fear or different kinds of fear and fear and you could say, uh, how do you say it? Fear and, and just being in the, just fear of the uniform also. But everyone should report these crimes because it creates data for the, the city, for the government actually. And all, all data is, uh, it, it creates, it could create uh, pre preventive measures to to protect other Asians and the community. And, and it'll create notices for, to put out to the community that this is happening, where it's happening, when it's happening. The other problem was, as a police officer, we have to try and gather more information of like a video or witnesses and especially now when there's no one on the streets you're not it's not going to be easy to find witnesses and with stores closed you're not going to be able to get video of of the crime or the assault or whatever occurred the basic bias crime that assault that occurred so it's it's very difficult being you know being out there and speaking to people that don't want to talk to you.
or trying to gather information. So, yeah, we, as, and as other, uh, we call other Asian societies, other Jade societies, other police agencies sees also, we have to be, do a better job of, of connecting with one another and sharing information. Officer Chow, uh, speaking of the, uh, the Asian Jade Society, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about, about this society? I think people probably outside of New England um, might not have heard about this society or outside of law enforcement. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more uh, what this society is about and what, what are they doing uh, in relate to, to the pandemic? Well, a lot of officers are now on, uh, out of uh, being quarantined because they had contact with, uh, with other people and officers that have got sick. So, but the Asian J Society, especially for, I guess, the New York districts and other uh, police agencies, we, we, we provide information and we we provide information and uh, within our membership more or less you have kind of, for for our agency we have you have to be a police officer to be a member and I, I don't know exactly other uh, how other agencies are run or other J societies are run you could be a retired but you still have to be a law enforcement officer to be in. But we just mostly just to cultivate the, our culture and pass on and and you know network and create create a safe environment where we could talk to each other and speak and and during our meetings. That's what we really created these for. Great. Um... Uh, I thank you for joining us, and I have more questions for you that hopefully we can uh, get to ask you later. Uh, so, let, but for now, let's uh, move on to our next panelist. Uh, so, uh, but just know that we feel a lot safer that now you're back on the force, and and your colleagues are uh, out there uh, protecting us. Uh, so we really appreciate you. Uh, Karen, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Um, so, uh, and, and also, you know, your consistent support for uh, for CGCC. Uh, uh, Karen Company Paul Wes is a uh, associate member uh, for our organization, and we have a lot of uh, collaborations. Uh, as a legal warrior with uh, a stellar pro bono record. <laughs> Um, what can you tell us about uh, the uh, coronavirus-related uh, discriminations? Right. Um, I, I've actually, I had a few slides. I don't know if you guys are able to um, post them. Um, I guess Ching Wen is, is aiming to doing that. Great. Uh, so this first slide is just uh, trying to give everyone a sense of how uh, people define hate crimes. Um, in general, it is uh, a criminal offense that is motivated in part or in, in whole by um, bias against uh, a person's race, religion, or other uh, factors listed here. Um, there is a federal law definition of hate crime. Um, it requires the use of a dangerous weapon, uh, but there are also different uh, definitions and all around the same concept uh, that most of the states uh, in this country have, uh, which makes it a, uh, an offense uh, to commit a hate crime, which has penalties that are higher than they normally would be for a non-hate related crime of the same nature. Uh, and so there are, there's a federal scheme and then there are many, many state uh, laws. There are a few states listed here that do not have state hate crime uh, statutes. But in general, um, each state has um, some type of hate crime uh, law. And in general, these types of crimes are prosecuted at the state level. So although the federal uh, law enforcement uh, officers and, and uh, lawyers can 
prosecute these, these crimes, in most cases they will defer to the local and state um, law enforcement uh, to, to handle these things unless the crime has a particularly egregious element. Um, but there, there are guidelines for when the federal government can step in, um, and it's fairly broad uh, when they decide in their judgment they, they ought to step in. Um, of course, not every uh, incident necessarily involves a crime, um, as uh, Dr. Jung was talking about. There are also many, many incidents, um, which we would call bias incidents, uh, where there is uh, an act of hate that is not necessarily a crime in and of itself, but it certainly has a very uh, significant negative impact on the victim, on the individuals, and on the communities. And it's something that um, is very important to stop, to analyze, and to prevent, um, to make sure that people are protected um, so that these things don't happen uh, as often, and, and certainly that they don't escalate uh, into even more violent incidents. Um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Jingwen. Um, I, I've listed here uh, just a few points on reporting uh, both hate crimes and bias incidents. Can we scroll to the next slide? <laughs> I'll just start talking anyway. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, as Officer Chow was saying, it's very difficult sometimes to get people to report on their experiences. There's a natural fear, a, a natural, um, sort of uh, desire not to engage with law enforcement or not to talk about bad things and to relive them uh, by reporting them. Um, it, you know, what we found is, of course, that if um, people can be uh, convinced to share their stories, it can have a very, very positive uh, impact on the community. Um, of course, if it's a crime, a hate crime, uh, reporting those incidents to local law enforcement um, would help to bring justice uh, to, to, um, to, to stop the perpetrators of these crimes, perhaps prevent future crimes. Uh, and so there is definitely a, a whole litany of law enforcement resources to help with that reporting, both at the local level as well as at the federal level. And I've listed on the slide um, the sort of field offices for the FBI. I know this is a national audience, so um, certainly you can go to the federal uh, resources, uh, but also your local police department uh, in the first instance would be the, the natural place to report. And then we have um, you know, like Dr. Jung was talking about, um, tracking of bias incidents as well. And there are many organizations today that are tracking um, these stories and, and, and trying to get people to report on their experiences. I've listed a few of them here, including the one that Dr. Jung was talking about. Um, and of course, the China General Chamber of Commerce, who is now also um, going to uh, try to pull together um, some of these stories. And again, it's, it's very important, even if it's not a crime, uh, to share these stories because this type of data is uh, helpful for uh, tracking the problem, for identifying the source of the problem, for um, academics to, to analyze the issues and to help effect change down the road. So, you know, certainly for whether it's a crime or just a bias incident, um, reporting that, sharing that story, if you're not going to law enforcement, sharing it with one of these uh, community-based organizations can do a lot of good for the community. Uh, and finally, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I've listed here some of the pro bono uh, resources. Um, if you are encountering um, problems, uh, some kind of you're a victim of a crime or an incident and you need uh, some legal help or legal guidance, if you need um, help understanding what your rights are, what your options are. Uh, there are many, many organizations right now, legal organizations that are um, trying to make an effort to, to provide pro bono uh, legal assistance. I've listed some of the big ones here, the first one being the uh, National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, which works through its um, affiliates. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm, I'm with uh, Abney, which is the New York uh, affiliate uh, of NAPABA, and Abney's been doing a lot of 
um, projects and efforts to get information out there to help distribute um, information on, on know your rights in various COVID related areas, including uh, anti violence, anti Asian violence. Um, and there are also clinics that these associations have. And if you need help, um, you, you can call any of these um, organizations and try to get some resources um, so, so that you can help take care of your problem. But I think the community is really coming together and, and it's uh, we just want to get the word out that there are resources here and it is important to to know your rights and, and to um, share your stories. Thank you, Karen. Um, and to the audience, we will have all this information on the resource page that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you can definitely uh, go there and, and kind of uh, retrieve all the information that you found interesting today. And also, you know, once we have our recordings ready, uh, please share that with your families and friends. Uh, they probably would find this information valuable to them too. Um, so last but not least, uh, Deputy Secretary Burunda, uh, what can you tell us from the uh, state government perspective? I think I'll you. Well, first of all, I wanna congratulate the uh, Chinese General, General Chamber of Commerce for uh, this, insightful webinar. Uh, it's important to pull all aspects of the community together, uh, both uh, 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 Asians and, and, and others. I, I think as an Hispanic, and so I'll preach to myself for just a moment, uh, many times we can get siloed and pigeonholed into our own communities. And so um, it, it's really important to, to kind of break outside of the community to uh, talk about these particular issues uh, as we, we've been discussing, and I was smiling to myself because so many of the issues that are uh, prevalent, especially at this point in time in, in the Chinese and Asian community in general, uh, are, are very common to the Hispanic experience. Uh, one of the things that uh, we battled here, I'm from uh, the West Coast, I was born in East LA before the song, which some of you may, uh, you may get that joke, and if, and if if you get it, I know how old you are, and if you don't, I know how old you are. Uh, but uh, it, it, coming from the East Coast, where uh, so many uh, people look like I do, and and coming to the West Coast as a uh, or East Coast to, as a 25 year old, and people asking me what I was uh, was a completely different experience for me. And um, one of the things that we've uh, uh, had to help people understand here on the East Coast, specifically in Maryland, is that, hey, we're not all Mexican, because that's the common uh, uh, identity or identifier uh, that Latinos in general face. They're all Mexican. And uh, so it's, it's, it's been a process of education, and, and, I, and I know that, uh, you know, the, this particular issue uh, is not just a uh, 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 prevalent uh, or, or directed uh, specifically the, the hate and, and, and the racial slurs are not uh, always just directed at the Chinese community, but anybody who uh, is, is, is Asian or, or appears Asian. So these are, um, uh, these are commonalities that, that we share. Of course, Hispanics have always been uh, pointed to as carriers of diseases and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, we, I, I shared a few days ago that uh, as we're kind of briefing for this particular call, that there was a, an outbreak or an infestation of bed bugs in, in Maryland, and perhaps it was national in scope, but specifically here in Maryland. And uh, Hispanics were identified as a carrier of these bed bugs. And so uh, we, we we understand, we empathize uh, as the Latino community. But the important thing I think is for us to, as, as leaders in our communities, to uh, not self-speak. You know, don't, we, we can't get caught up in the silo of our specific community. We need to be able to share our experiences outside uh, of the community. And that's one of the things that I, uh, that I see as being valuable in a forum like this that you're bringing uh, people from uh, outside of the community in to, uh, to empathize and to share uh, our perspective as well. 
before I go to before I go any further, I want to thank uh, Officer Chow for his service to uh, uh, our community, to his community in New York, and uh, I, I I empathize uh, with um, uh, law enforcement in general. Um, my brother uh, is a, a law enforcement officer in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I have cousins that are law enforcement officers in California. Uh, I have six children. Two of them uh, serve uh, uh, as uh, Baltimore County police officers right here in Maryland. So thank you so much for what you do on a daily basis, putting your life on the line every time you put your uniform on. So we, we, we appreciate you uh, and honor you and thank you for your service. I don't know if uh, anything resonated that I said, I, and, 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 I'm, and, and I'm open to answering any questions that you might have, but once again, we thank you for uh, opening up the forum. Thank you, Louis. Um, I, I I didn't know you had so uh, so many of your family members that are in you know public service. Uh, so really appreciate that all you do, your family does, and uh, you know the relationship that we have with uh, Governor Hogan uh, and with your great state. Uh, we're we're lucky. Uh, we're very lucky to be able to count you as and. Um, uh you, you know you have you your team has to uh make some tough decisions lately uh but i think that your government is doing a exemplary job to uh, keep americans safe um just just on a side note the washington dc chapter of cgcc has been working with the maryland first ladies team to donate these masks to uh, mema uh the the emergency agency in maryland so, so we're ha very happy that we can do our bit in uh, helping out uh, Marylanders, who is, uh, uh, you know, is one one of uh, our biggest constituencies in, in in our in our chapter. So, uh, really appreciate you. Uh, we, now, I'm sorry. I was just going to say we do engage with uh, uh, the uh, uh, CGCC on a regular basis. Several levels of our state government uh, engage. And, and thanks for putting me on your invite list. I, I, I attend uh, uh, as many uh, events as I can. Uh, and, and it's just a, a joy to be able to uh, share with you our, our common experiences, uh, especially as, a, uh, as, as, as you're a, a business or, or organization that's part of my background. And I, and I always enjoy the opportunity to be around business people. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so now uh, we, we have about maybe 10 minutes left for, for Q&A. Uh, I want to open the, uh, the floor up to audience questions, uh, but let me just remind you, uh, please use the Q&A uh, function on your Zoom app. That's a little better than the chat function. Um, and then when you ask a question, please identify yourself uh, with, uh, with your name and affiliation. Um, so. I think one person asked a question the first, I think that's our own uh, CGCC staff, uh, Luo Xu, I think she asked the question uh, that, you know, if um, not that the government seems to have acknowledged that wearing a mask uh, is uh, helpful to prevent the disease, uh, why don't people think, um, well, maybe the, the Asian community was right in wearing masks in, in, in early days. In, in other words, when do we get some uh, recognition for uh, treating, the, <laughs> treating the disease seriously from the beginning? Um, I think that uh, I, I was uh, find this question to, uh, to Dr. Jiang first and then all the other panelists, if you want to jump in, you can jump in too. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, if more Americans have this than people in China now, why don't they call it the American virus, right? Or uh, um, the, the problem is that I think it's already ingrained in people's minds that the virus is associated with Chinese people, that politicians, again, use it as a, a way of scapegoating. And so uh, as long as the political rhetoric continues to reinforce that this is a Chinese disease, people will continue to see Chinese people are more infected 
even if everyone's wearing a mask. Other panelists, do you, do you want to jump in? Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next question. I'm uh, scrolling through the, the chat. Uh, I think Yang Chen asked a, a really good question. So of the nearly 1,500 reports received to date by Professor Jiang, how many of those have led to arrests and how many have resulted in... Yeah, that's a good have question about, that. about um, the assailants. We're not really tracking the assailants, but we are going back and looking at all the fraud cases and seeing how many of them were reported and how many of them were um, acted upon. I know a lot of people are interested in how well hate crimes are being enforced, but I, I do want to emphasize that this isn't solely a hate crime enforcement issue. It's a broader issue of anti-Asian hate. It's a broader issue of um, being scapegoated. And um, so the, the remedy isn't just hate crime enforcement. It's one of the remedies, but it's also changing um, the rhetoric. It's changing um, the media that we um, are encountering. It's changing the basic national narrative about China bashing that we really have to work on together. Thank you. Um, so we, we, we have another question here. Um, if you report a discrimination case to a police officer via phone, for example, do you have to go through uh, documents? I guess they mean, you know, filling out paperwork or something or walk into the police station? Uh, I guess that would be a question for uh, Officer Chow. So uh, knowing that you know, we're all under uh, shelter in place orders, how do people seek law enforcement help these days? You can call your uh, local precinct or, uh, or uh, police department, and you could, you could do it via on the phone or you can walk over. You could walk there, you could step into a police uh, precinct or building, and they'll take your information. Uh, personal documents, no, they're not, I mean, they might ask you for ID, just to make sure you, you are who you are also, but they're not going to check your background or, uh, or run your background and, and, and see if you, you know, you have any warrants or anything like that. They're not going to do that. But they're not, then they're, but they're not going to, I don't know how other departments do it, but they're not going to send someone to your house either to, to try to take right. the information because that's just uh, wasting police resources and taking another police officer off the street to go and knock and go to every house to try to take information. That's just uh, not going to happen. Thank you. Um, so we, ha we have a question from uh, Lanier uh, Saperstein. As we approach the general election, how do we uh, rebuild the all too easy China bashing from both political parties? Uh, I don't know, Louis, if that's a political question. I don't know if we want to take on it since you're <laughs> an incumbent government official. Um, let me know if if you don't. Uh, so do, do you do you do you see that in your own um, in your own state? Do politicians try to capitalize on on this? And uh, how do we um, how do we make sure you know as we get into general elections, um, especially you being you know part of the assessor state office election is is a, is a, is a good thing for you guys. How do we keep it, uh, keep, keep good. our elections? Uh, what about you, good? Was, was that question directed to me? I'm sorry. Yes, Lewis. yes. Just re rephrase that question. I was getting some background noise. Right, uh, sorry. So uh, the question about a general election and how do we, uh, uh, influence the, uh, the political discourse so this kind of a uh, uh, honorable yeah I, I wish that there was a, a, a real easy or simple answer uh, to that unfortunately uh, 
issues like this in general are, are for whatever reason, politicized um, and by, by both sides uh, of the aisle. And uh, they're, they're, but I would say this is that I would hope that um, that the politicization politicization of, of these issues are are on the fringe. And I understand the professor's point about uh, the the uh, mainstream um, uh, politicians calling this a, the, the the Chinese virus or the Chinese flu. And I and I get that because we had in the 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 Spanish flu, if 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 you recall your history as well. So we we understand, you know, the the hurt, you know, that that's that naming or na uh, nationalizing uh, a, a particular disease uh, can cause in communities. Um, you know, I, I I think part of the issue is 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 continuing to uh, educate uh, people. Uh, about um, uh, whatever the the disease is, unfortunately, this is not going to be the last pandemic that we um, uh, face. The next one might might source here from the United from the U.S. Who knows? So it's it's really important that we you know come together as people and support each other in, in our communities and and fight. Uh, this kind of discrimination where, or, or, or hatred, wherever we see it. Uh, I, I, I can tell you and, uh, that if I saw it personally happening, uh, I would step in and say something. And I hope that we all would, because it's, 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 it's about who we are as people. And as we, when we denigrate one another, uh, that uh, denigrates all of us. It, it, it really uh, eats at our humanity. And uh, so we we need to combat it where where wherever we see it, and whoever we see it perpetrated again, against. So so we're we're running out of time. I'll do one last question that's from the uh, the the Q and A function. Uh, it's it's about how do we kind of uh, educate our young people or change our schools uh, to address the, the 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 situation. I think. Uh, if all of you can just give a, a short, per, uh, precise answer on that question, what should we do as community leaders from our uh, various backgrounds to, uh, one, protect our children, and two, uh, no matter what, what racial background they're from, give our children a healthy outlook on racial relationships in, in America. Uh, Karen, since you haven't talked for a while, I'll start with you and then we'll go down the line. Sure. I mean, this is an issue dear to my heart because I have two young children, uh, third grade and first grade. Um, and I have heard stories from my neighbors of their children, their uh, mixed, um, you know, Chinese and, and, and uh, British. Uh, and their children had, were, were on one of these Zoom uh, calls with their school and said, hi, you know, we don't have coronavirus. Like he felt the need to tell all of his classmates that he doesn't have coronavirus because he's Asian. And so I think it is an important issue to discuss with your children. Um, you know, obviously dialogue in the family is, is really the, the, the core thing to, to helping to educate our, our children about these real world issues. But I do think there's also um, stuff that the, that the school can do and the school community can do. Um, our school has, you know, a variety of emotional, socio-emotional, um, you know, assignments or projects or videos and, and discussions. A little harder to do right now um, with the, the distance learning. Um, I think it's important to suggest to schools that there be some dialogue around the subject. Um, it's you know something that I think schools nowadays are trying to respond to, and it's something perhaps they hadn't considered or don't have materials yet to do. And, and we as a community can work with them to suggest activities or dialogue talking points um, that the schools can initiate and, and, and try to have uh, within their classrooms. Thank you. Officer Chow, uh, any thoughts on uh, educating and protecting children and young people these days? I think you, uh, they should create uh, an environment where they can share the, the experiences. Just like, uh, just like the, we have the Asian J Society, it was created 
for all police officers, but mainly Asian police officers to to share knowledge, to share their experiences, to share any information that we might have. We all work in different places, locations, different states. We are a bi-state agency, so we have different laws and different rules and regulations in different in our states. So, and all sorts of information. Like, but if you're in like school, bigger Asian schools or uh, bigger schools usually ha have uh, clubs like an Asian club, especially in Asian uh, society communities, they, they have those. But if they, you don't have one, create one. You can have five members in it. And it still creates a safe environment and you, you know you're not alone. It's, it's very important to know that what, whatever happens to you, you're not the first person that's happened to, and you won't be the last. And ha putting that out there, sharing that information is very, uh, is very, uh, you know, I guess you could say is, um, it feels good to not, to know that you're not doing, you're not going through this alone, whatever uh, incident that occurred. So if you don't have a club, create one. And even when we were, when our society started, it was only like, maybe like even about 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there's probably only like two, three police officers that were Asian. And it was created for within those three officers. And now we are about, we have about 50 members. So it, you, you could just start with two, three people and, the, and that, and you will get more people to come. That is great uh, advice. Uh, Deputy Secretary Barona, as a father of six, I'm sure you have your thoughts on this uh, subject matter. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, giving our children, uh, children a, a healthy perspective of who they are uh, is extremely important. Um, I'd be remiss if I, if I neglected uh, our, 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 our faith base um, in, in our family, uh, our, our faith is central and key uh, to uh, how we see ourselves. Uh, sharing our faith with others is, is important, uh, something that we've imparted to our children as well. So we want to make sure that, they, that, our, that our children understand that they have dignity and self-worth, self-worth uh, that is based in, in, uh, in uh, and who we are and, and why we were created and the purpose uh, that we have in life. Thank you. Uh, Professor John, you started us off today, so I'm going to let you uh, finish it off as well. So any last thoughts on protecting and educating our children in this special time? Thanks. Um, you know, protecting our kids at this time is, is really critical because, again, I think they're suffering the most. I want to emphasize this isn't a Chinese community's problem or an Asian American issue. This is other communities' problem with us, others' problem, and others need to be educated. So this requires not us to do anything to prove ourselves as American. I mean, it's good that we do start Asian American organizations and clubs, but really it's a government's responsibility to, to, to provide safety for everybody. It's a government's responsibility to track hate crimes. It's a government's responsibility to provide education about the history of people. So I think, I think you don't just need a forum. This should be part of the curriculum. Ethnic studies should be a curriculum. You know, if you just learn history, you'll realize this type of racism has occurred to all groups, right? That what's happened to Asian Americans now happened to Latinos, happened to African Americans, and still does. So I would actually argue Asian Americans should require their school districts to implement curriculum, um, history curriculum, social studies curriculum, and anti-bullying curriculum, and make it part of the um, required study, not just an occasional forum. Thank you. Uh, Jingwen, if you could, uh, if, if the link is ready, if you could throw up the, the link to our resource page on the screen uh, and, and maybe put that in chat too so people can easily copy and paste. So everybody, the link that you see there, uh, it's the link to the, um, uh, to the resource page and we'll put that in chat. 
and then you go to our website, you can find that too. So uh, all the information that we've shared today is gonna be on there uh, and including the, the recording of today's session. So uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists for your time and, and your expertise. Uh, this has been a, a truly eye-opening and informative session. I learned a lot today and uh, for our audiences, thank you for participating on a, on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, stay tuned, we have more webinars coming through our eConnect series. Uh, uh, keep your eyes on our social media platforms and on our website. Uh, until next time, uh, you know, take care and, uh, you know, still stay at home and be safe. Uh, let's, uh, but stay in touch, stay social. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.